Good afternoon and a warm welcome everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to host today's event organized by the Council on Geostrategy, the newest foreign affairs think tank based in the heart of London and dedicated to making the United Kingdom as well as other free and open nations more united, stronger and greener. As Prime Minister Boris Johnson recently stated, the military machine that President Putin is assembling towards the force which seized Crimea and ignited the war in eastern Ukraine back in 2014. We are witnessing the biggest military buildup in Europe since the Cold War. And yesterday, President Putin ordered Russian troops and tanks into Ukraine's eastern regions. The Kremlin is without a doubt a direct and acute threat to British interests, not least towards close allies and partners in Central and Eastern Europe, as well as the open international order. Since 2014, Ukraine has borne the brunt of Russian aggression, which appears to be increasing once again. This is why the United Kingdom has sought to deepen its cooperation with Ukraine to help make the country more resilient in the face of Russian belligerents. With an increasing British military post in Eastern Europe and a persistent Royal Navy presence in the Black Sea, it is vital to understand how the relationship between London and Kiev is evolving and what the two countries can do to assist one another in relation to Russia. And today we have a wonderful opportunity to discuss these critical issues regarding British-Ukrainian relations in a more comp competitive era. We will hear the key insights on these issues and more from Mr. John Tinjanogli, who is a vice chair of APPG on Ukraine and a member of the House of Commons in the United Kingdom. Mr. Dmitry Nataluka, who is a member of the Ukrainian parliament and a co-chair of the Ukraine-UK caucus there. Dr. Hanna Shellist, who is director of security programs from PRISM Think Tank in Ukraine. And James Rogers, who is a co-founder and director of research at the Council on Geostrategy. Mr. Chenoki is a member of parliament for Huntington, and he has served a number of role, in the number of roles within the government, including as trade and industry spokesman, shadowing the Department for Business, Enterprise and Regulatory Reform, and as a shadow solicitor general for England and Wales. Mr. Chenoki also served as a parliamentary undersecretary of state in the Ministry of Justice from 2010 to 2012. We are also joined by Mr. Dmitry Nataluka, who will be with us shortly, and he's a member of the Ukrainian parliament, serving as the public deputy of Ukraine since 2019. He is also an active, active in international politics, serving as a member of Ukraine's parliament delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Among his other roles, Mr. Nataluka is also the co-chairman of the Ukraine-UK caucus. We are also delighted to be joined by Dr. Hanna Shellist. She is the Director of Security Programs at Ukrainian PRISM, a Ukraine-based foreign policy think tank. She is also the Editor-in-Chief of Ukraine Analytica, and she has previously served as a Senior Researcher at Odessa Branch of the National Institute for Strategic Studies and is a Visiting Research Fellow at the NATO Defense College in Italy. She specializes in conflict resolution and security issues. And finally, we are delighted to be joined by James Rogers, who is a co-founder and director of research at the Council on Geostrategy. He held numerous positions at the Henry Jackson Society, the Baltic Defense College, and at the European Union Institute for Security Studies. He holds um, a bachelor's degree in international politics and strategic studies from University of Wales at Upper East Lip, and also um, a master's in philosophy and contemporary European studies from the University of Cambridge. So before we start, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Our panelists will speak for about 30 minutes. In the second half of an hour, we will move to our Q&A session with the audience. Mr. Nataluka should join us within the next 10 minutes because of his vote uh, at the Ukrainian parliament. And therefore, we will start with Mr. Ginogli, followed by Dr. Hannah Schellest, and followed by James Rogers. Finally, the event will end with a Q&A session, but please do feel free to ask your questions during the course of the event. And please indicate your name, role, and affiliation, and to whom you are addressing your question. So without any further delay, Mr. Ginogli, the floor is yours. Mr. Genogli, I believe you're muted. I'm muted. Victoria, hello, thank you. And um, it's uh, good to be here on what turned out to be an important day um, in relation to Ukraine generally. But uh, I was asked to discuss the UK Ukraine relationship specifically. So before we go on to talk about Russian aggression, guns, and sanctions. Uh, I would like to explain something of the important developing economic relationship between the UK and the Ukraine. Um, trade has been significantly increasing since uh, Ukraine UK signed an FTA in November 2020. Uh, total trade from a very low base has now gone up to about £1.8 billion 
to the end of 2021, that was a rise of 31% a year. And to the uh, same year end, total import from the Ukraine to the UK were one billion pounds. So that was an increase of nearly 60% in that year alone. The UK is exporting machinery, farmer and cust, and the Ukraine is exporting to the UK iron cereals and oils. Um, and UK business has also been significantly investing in Ukraine uh, to the tune of three billion pounds in the year, last year alone, which is almost 700% higher than in 2019. So a lot is now going on. Ukraine uh, has also, of course, signed a deep and comprehensive FTA with, with the European Union. Um, and the EU is by far Ukraine's largest trade partner at about 40%. Russia is Ukraine's third largest trade partner behind China. But the projection for Russia trade is, is constant down, not least because Russia cancelled its FTA with Ukraine and imposed sanctions. Uh, and presumably now things are only going to go to the worst. In recent months, uh, I have to say I have had no little sympathy with those in Ukraine, including the president, who have wished to minimize overreaction and panic. Um, I find it hugely impressive how despite ongoing war and ongoing casualties in the East, uh, Ukrainians have been so determined to develop economically at the same time. Yes, uh, they know that they need to deal with corruption issues, and yes, they are uh, need to improve their civil society institutions and economic regulatory structures. But the statistics that I just give show, I think, that they are moving in the right direction. On the ground, of course, the daily relationships with Russia are complex. Uh, the simple fact is that many Ukrainians do have long established relationships with Russia or family or cultural links. But it would be wrong to confuse these with the same people also wishing the sovereignty of their country, Ukraine, to be respected by Russia. Also, there still seems to be an attitude of many in the West um, that think that just because the Soviet empire imploded, Russia and its interests and willingness to use aggression would also disappear. Uh, this, in retrospect, was a grave miscalculation and our following underestimation of Russian latent aggression and expansionism is something that the West need to address and we need to address it collectively. However, in the meantime, I do appreciate that there is now the reality of Russian military incursion. Although the future extent of this is unknown, we know that Russian forces have now entered Ukrainian separatist areas in breach of the Minsk Accords. We also see a daily escalation of conflict. And it is tempting at this point just to concentrate on military issues and sanctions and to put trade and invest to one side. Personally, I think that that would be a big mistake. Clearly, the UK government had at the forefront after the United States of military assistance to Ukraine provision of non-legal equipment, uh, 20,000 Ukrainian troops being trained, and now provision of anti-tank missiles. Also, British politicians and diplomats have been instrumental in building a Western coalition united in their intention to prevent an invasion to severely damage Russia and support the destitution through tough sanctions, the first of which I've just heard announced uh, in the Chamber of Commons. Let's be frank here. If we, the West allies, decide to send Russia into the economic dark ages, into poverty, into exchange by barter, we have the ability to do so without a shot being fired. And whether we have this unity will now be the key test following the illegal recognition by Russia yesterday. Yes, there will be economic pain on the allies and to some more than others. But working together, we can minimize that. For instance, assisting oil and gas purchase to Germany. A small price, I think, to uphold Ukraine's national sovereignty and to stop war and large-scale slaughter on our own continent. But in addition to military help and actions, let me come back to trade and investment, which is too often downplayed here. As large as the Russian invasion force is, it is doubtful that it is adequate to garrison the whole of a defeated Ukraine. That is, Russia wanted to pay for a defeated Ukraine, which is unlikely. 
they are marked by a huge lack of investment by Russia wherever they go. If you look at uh, the occupied part of Ukraine, if you look at Abkhazia in Georgia, Russia doesn't want to pay for these countries. A weak Ukraine, dominated by Russia, with destroyed infrastructure, corruption, there would probably be much more Russia's liking. Which is why, as much as we help prepare Ukraine for war, it is vital Western allies make it clear to Russia that in any post-war period, as much as we're going to push Russia with sanctions, we will also fully support and invest in Ukraine, such that Ukraine will be in a better position of whatever actions Russia may take than before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chinogli, for your um, speech. And we are now also joined by Mr. Natalukha. So I would like to ask Mr. Natalukha to speak next. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Victoria. And uh, thank you all for organizing this and for having me. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, uh, so I, I can proceed, can I? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you again. So I'm just back from the session in the parliament and uh, basically the, the parliament of Ukraine has just voted on the, uh, I think it's historical uh, resolution uh, condemning the, the actions of Russia, um, introducing sanctions, asking uh, and addressing other states to introduce sanctions, recognizing the Crimea and the Donbass territories is an integral part of Ukraine's sovereign territory. So um, for us, um, I think it was something that uh, has been expected, to be honest, because I mean, uh, it's uh, it was it, it it was a matter of of, of a couple of scenarios that uh, Putin might pursue in Ukraine. So either a full scale invasion, and we really didn't see the potential for that uh, yet, uh, or the recognition of these territories, um, and then uh, making uh, basically a spearhead out of them uh, in order to further uh, punch and poke uh, Ukraine and uh, uh, create tension um, every time he wants to. But ironically, what happened is that uh, in, t in eight years, uh, Putin has, made, has, has managed to do what NATO uh, wasn't able to do in 14 years. So he basically recognized a belligerent uh, side uh, in a conflict um, and uh, provided it with security guarantees. And um, this is uh, a very dark humor, but these are the facts. And um, this changes dramatically. Uh, I think that the security architecture of uh, of the world and uh, it it pushes the boundaries of normality and the boundaries of acceptable and pushes them in in a very wrong way. Um, so uh, while uh, NATO has been hesitating for fourteen years, he did that in eight, and let's be honest, he could have done that even one year after it all started, uh, but uh, it took him some time because he was. Uh, considering uh, that he was able to, to negotiate it first with Poroshenko and then with Zelensky, some kind of trade-offs and stuff. Um, so uh, for us now, it's, uh, uh, it's a matter of uh, what to do next. And um, of course, we are counting on our diplomatic um, uh, potential and we're counting on, on, the, on our Western partners. And uh, the UK here for us is uh, the, the major ally, I think uh, the boldest one, if I may. Um, and I, I think that it's time for London um, to, uh, to keep up uh, the absolutely squashed uh, European leadership and to, to become a new leader in Europe uh, and to build up a new European front against authoritarianism, against kleptocracy and against, against uh, Putinism in Russia and uh, all those who support it. Because uh, I, I came from Munich conference just yesterday and um, the main topic was not just Ukraine, but how through this conflict, we can see a new clash of, uh, of ideologies. Uh, so what was once uh, a clash between you know, capitalism and communism today became a clash of uh, democracy versus authoritarianism. And um, it, if it's so important, then we definitely have to make a very bold movement 
um, not to uh, let the, the rest of the world see that crony autocrats uh, have a right to behave however they want uh, without respecting basic rules that have been established by all civilized countries a uh, long time ago and that have been respected by civilized countries. So um, I think with that in mind, um, the, the, there is a vacuum, unfortunately, uh, a vacuum of, of power, a vacuum, a, a vacuum of leadership in, in, in the European continent. And that vacuum needs to be, needs to be filled. And um, I think that uh, this potential alliance of London, Kiev and Warsaw is a very great uh, step towards filling that vacuum. Um, we, we really need a new alliance, we need a, uh, a new united front uh, because uh, it's really not about Ukraine, it's about, um, it's about the world we live in, it's about what we're used to it, and it's about uh, are we ready to give it up? Are we ready to, to, um, to uh, comfort the thought that, um, that democracy is weak? that uh, Western values are weak, that uh, the West is weak itself. I think it's about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Natalukha. And now I would like to ask Dr. Hannah Schellis to give her speech. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, it's really strange moment uh, for this discussion. We've been planning this event uh, for quite a long time, hoping to speak uh, just about strategic relations between Ukraine and the United Kingdom. But the events of the last week are changing our plans. But at the same time, it seems to me that UK and Ukraine are coming very well prepared to this crisis in terms of the bilateral relations. The agreement that we signed in October 2020 about establishing of strategic relations uh, it was both the first step and the uh, uh, certain peak in the relations where we uh, uh, really stated the strategic uh, level of these relations after the Brexit. And as we had a bad joke here that Brexit is bad for the United Kingdom, but it became good for Ukraine because the United Kingdom in terms of security and economic cooperation could finally freely um, develop the relations with Ukraine, where sometimes London being a little bit limited by other European Union member states. So uh, that's definitely, from the global point of view, is a little bit um, dark jokes, but the real facts are demonstrating it. Uh, we just heard about, in the beginning, about the economic raise and definitely 40% of raise in trade in one year. And we are speaking about pandemic year when not full capacities and full uh, opportunities could be developed. That's already great numbers. But at the same time, what is even more important, it is how the strategic relations in terms of security have been developed since uh, 2018. And it seems to me two events really influenced it. Uh, first is uh, um, uh, Salisbury and the uh, incident and attack at the uh, uh, soil of the United Kingdom that made a lot of people in the United Kingdom think about the reality that this uh, Russian aggression is uh, uh, something very close. It's not something very far in Ukraine, but it, it's something that can touch um, your people and uh, um, your life. And the same is, uh, uh, in fact, it had after Ukrainian navy ships being captured and the further deterioration with the navigation and the Black Sea and everything that had been happening in the maritime domain. Because we understand that for each nation, there are certain things which are so important and so basic that uh, they touch the uh, all fibers of the uh, soul. And for the United Kingdom uh, uh, sea, ocean and maritime domain uh, was always uh, this. So after this, we started to see all the developments and cooperation, increase of cooperation in uh, Navy development, uh, support for the uh, um, Navy basis construction, for the six uh, ships that should be constructed for the Ukrainian Navy, training uh, uh, and increase of all other support in this sphere that uh, really been very important for the uh, um, Ukrainian Navy that almost all left in uh, Crimea. But that was just a good beginning. It was just a start that uh, now uh, uh, with the last few months' Russian build-up, we saw very clear position uh, of London. 
uh, luckily not only of London, because we've heard the same position from Edinburgh uh, to Dublin, to, I mean, all around the British Islands. And that, that's really important. And in terms of uh, uh, territorial integrity, diplomatic support, uh, that was very good. Cybersphere as well. Let's not forget that uh, um, Ukraine and UK have been discussing the cybersecurity very seriously as the uh, potential and existence sphere of cooperation, because we are living in the time of the new attacks when cybersphere became the uh, fifth domain of the warfare. So it's not a, some small technical way of cooperation. But uh, still, we're in a little bit of the strange situation when, on the one hand, Ukraine is constantly in the UK news. But on the other hand, last year, um, Ukrainian Prism, on the request of the Ukrainian Institute, made a big um, research that today, exactly today, being presented in Ukrainian language. We expected it being presented last week in uh, English as well. Uh, but we needed to postpone because of the current developments, but you already can find the full text of the report at the website of Ukrainian Institute. It is about how Ukraine and Ukrainian culture is perceived in the United Kingdom. And that is really interesting because we interviewed people uh, uh, from uh, museums uh, to artists, uh, composers, musicians, uh, art directors, uh, politicians, so very, very difficult people. And the results were interesting that, for example, when you speak about Crimea, uh, British people perfectly remember the Crimea War of the 19th century, but almost nobody can speak about Crimean Tatars. Uh, or when you speak about uh, um, a lot of, of the artistic names, they associate them with the Soviet Union a lot and still associate Ukraine as the post-Soviet or Soviet uh, with the uh, dominance of the Russian culture as something uh, from the empirical uh, times of the Russian Empire. Classical ballet should be just Russian, uh, avant-garde should be Russian. And this brings a certain um, second level perception of uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian culture when you go to this level. So uh, the only thing where you really see a jump of knowledge or something, uh, I mean, awareness, it is Eurovision. And that was really shocked us a little bit, but, but that demonstrates the perception. Yeah, we know about Ukraine, what is in the news. And uh, uh, sometimes about very, very modern contemporary issues because that would already caught attention of the uh, public. Uh, why I made it so much in detail just to demonstrate that currently we have quite a disproportional uh, um, uh, probably issues in our relations. We have a very strong political support. We have a very strong military support of Ukraine. And uh, we have almost uh, absence of awareness at the public level, because uh, Ukraine is still unknown, it's still terra incognita, it is still perceived through the Russian lands or through the Soviet lands, and uh, as something what probably either not known or not so interesting for the British public. And we understand that any of the political decisions should be supported by the public level, and uh, Ukraine is definitely competing with the hundreds of others uh, for the British attention, but uh, uh, that is also the lesson for Ukrainians, and we made a lot of recommendations how to change this situation uh, to, uh, to have the public support um, of uh, Ukraine. But in general, if we very briefly for the last minute to jump for the modern, it seems to me that having this uh, background that we have now, it is extremely important not to lose momentum with the current developments that Russia presented us. So uh, when we are speaking about sanctions, Ukraine is definitely expecting very strong sanctions from the United Kingdom. And uh, let's be honest, not only financial sanctions, because uh, uh, it was said about some economic consequences, but let's speak about personal. Most of the children of uh, Russian politicians, of those who've been present at that National Security Council or among the MPs, they have either their houses in the United Kingdom or their kids living, or some of them even received the British citizenship. And uh, uh, true that children are not, uh, um, should not respond for the behavior of parents, but that's only in case when uh, uh, this behavior is not connected, and we understand perfectly that for many of the Russian politicians, that is a way to launder the money, uh, the corruption schemes, and uh, that looks quite uh, strange when on the, the father is blaming the West in everything, uh, uh, but then sending the 
um, uh, teenager kid uh, to study in the British work schools. So it seems that maybe it is less painful, but at the same time, very often uh, when these people uh, feel that they are uncontrolled, that they are unpunished, that they can freely travel and still enjoy all benefits of the West, but at the same time to uh, spread all the anti-Western propaganda, that looks a little bit odd because uh, uh, the UK economy would not lose in case some of these visas will be canceled, for example. Yeah, it's not influenced city or the uh, stock exchange. But that will be also the powerful signal that um, you will not be able just to use the territory of France or UK or Germany uh, while uh, your um, head of the family is voting for violating of the international law um, in the European country. Thank you, Dr. Hanna Schellest and um, James, over to you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, those were uh, three very interesting uh, contributions. So I thought I would start my very brief presentation uh, with uh, an overview of why UK-Ukrainian cooperation uh, matters and why it makes sense for it to be to be deepened. So, I mean, we've already heard quite extensively, and this is very clear, of course, the, the, the issue relating to the threat from Russia and the fact that it's led by an increasingly uh, an unhinged kleptocracy, which has just grown bolder and more aggressive than ever. And we've seen that in recent days with interventions by uh, Vladimir Putin and the uh, theatrics of the Russian Security Council. I think it's important to point out, and this is something that the British government's integrated review um, makes very clear, that is to say that the threat from Russia is now increasingly systemic. And if anyone was out in any doubt uh, up until now, uh, it's now been it's now increasingly clear. Uh, the issue at hand is the the issue of national sovereignty and self determination. These are two um, uh, issues at the very core of the international order. Um, and Russia, under its current leadership, seems set to um, uh, uh, break them and to change them fundamentally. Uh, and that is a threat not just to uh, Ukraine, but to the entire uh, international order, including where it is at densest, which is, of course, in uh, European, um, in, in, in Europe. And I think it's important to acknowledge there that our past failures, including our failure to respond more robustly uh, in honour of the 1994 Budapest Memorandum back in 2014, uh, have actually led to this crisis. So yes, of course, Vladimir Putin is responsible, but we could have done more to deter him. So that's one of the key reasons um, why cooperation between the UK and Ukraine matters, because frankly, Ukraine is on the front line and it is under direct um, attack. Uh, the next reason, I think, of course, is is related to that, and that is to help Ukraine, which, of course, is under constant and unrelenting pressure from Russia uh, to function, grow and mature as a democratic European nation. And I think it's important to point out here that through helping Ukraine realize its own destiny, uh, we confirm our own values and principles in the UK, not only as a democracy, but also as arguably um, with the acts of supremacy in the 16th century, uh, the first modern uh, nation. Uh, it also, I think, helps deeper, deeper Ukraine, uh, UK cooperation helps bind together uh, Europe's leading maritime power in the extreme west with its largest terrestrial power in the east and allows us to work together to better underpin European security, not only, of course, in relation to Russia, but also uh, more uh, broadly. And then finally, of course, um, and this has also been mentioned, uh, closer UK-Ukrainian cooperation uh, matters because it helps to facilitate trade, um, uh, technological cooperation, and of course, the generation of economic um, wealth. So the cooperation so far between the UK and um, Ukraine has developed quite rapidly over recent years, particularly since the uh, 2014 uh, intervention, or rather, I should say, aggression of Russia towards um, Ukraine and the annexation of, of, of Crimea. And that, of course, has been uh, facilitated through the UK-Ukraine Political Free Trade and Strategic Partnership Agreement, which uh, Hannah uh, mentioned uh, earlier, and that sets up a strategic partnership dialogue which um, should take place annually between the UK and Ukraine at the highest ministerial level to discuss a range of issues relating to foreign policy uh, and security policy dialogue as well as trade and economic cooperation all the way down to um, issues relating to cultural cooperation. 
Now, other forms of cooperation, and I would say even British political and strategic support to Ukraine are well known. They include, of course, Operation Orbital, which has already been mentioned, which has trained some 22,000 uh, Ukrainian uh, military personnel, the provision of 2,000 plus anti-tank weapons, the uh, provision of a £1.7 billion loan to Ukraine for the redevelopment of the Ukrainian Navy, which was uh, severely weakened with the annexation of Crimea in 2014. This will include the provision of two minesweepers, eight missile craft and uh, British contributions to um, Ukraine's future frigate program. So the, the, the cooperation has extended quite extensively over the last um, few years. But the, the issue then becomes, well, where should it develop into the future? Now, of course, there is an immediate need. The immediate need relates to the threat from Russia. Um, and as that threat un intensifies over the coming uh, weeks, uh, the UK, I think, will be one of the leading countries in responding to that. The question there for becomes how can the response be manifest? And of course, we've already mentioned uh, the issue of sanctions, but I think we need to probably go further than that. Um, it may mean that the UK and others, like minded, uh, will need to provide Ukraine with more military assistance. This might not mean the deployment of military personnel to Ukraine, but it may uh, include the uh, delivery of military equipment that the Ukrainian military can then use to deter or defend it defend Ukrainian territory against Russian attack. It may also mean the setting up of an airlift system to bring those supplies uh, to where they're needed uh, and also to supply Ukraine with equipment and military ammunition. In addition, the Royal Navy could perhaps be dispatched to the Black Sea to monitor the strategic situation and make Britain's presence felt. In addition, um, the UK should probably begin working more closely with allies to provide Ukraine with loads and grants to assist with economic stabilization and to shore up the Ukrainian economy as it has come under Russian attack, including, of course, the Ukrainian currency, the uh, hernia. Uh, finally, I think there needs to be some degree of um, coordination with like-minded countries to overcome Russian narratives, which have been pumped out uh, at, a, at an increasing clip over recent days and weeks, um, which are in incredibly uh, revisionist and seek to revise the entire historical uh, narrative of European security and um, the subsequent breakup of the Soviet Union and Russia's role uh, in the world. So that's the immediate form of cooperation, I think, that could be could be uh, facilitated. Looking ahead, uh, it needs to be a bit more strategic um, and, and needs to think beyond the immediate priority. And that's to say, um, I think the UK in particular needs to take the lead in Europe in terms of resisting Russia and reaffirming Ukraine, and for that matter, any country's right uh, to self-determination um, and, and to state sovereignty. And I think it's important to point out here that if some countries traditional allies stand in the way of that, then the UK should not accommodate them. Uh, this is actually an issue of centrality, of central strategic importance, um, and there can, be no, uh, there can be no time for those who uh, want to uh, stand in, in the way. And I think this is another issue that, that could be facilitated, and that is to say we can use new forms of uh, minilateral or plurilateral cooperation, or what the uh, Ukrainian foreign minister has called mini alliances. Um, one of those, of course, is the trilateral cooperation that is being established between the UK, Ukraine and um, Poland. And I think this could be expanded to cover additional areas to those already identified by the, the three foreign uh, ministers, which are, of course, coordinating support to the international Crimea platform, uh, increasing collaboration on cybersecurity, energy security and boosting strategic communications to counter disinformation. Um, there is, I think, potential there to expand into other uh, areas of cooperation, not, though, not least those related to security and defence. And then finally, other forms of uh, expansion of this um, uh, plurilateral or minilateral format could include drawing in other like-minded countries like the Baltic states and Georgia, um, some within NATO and the EU and some potentially outside of it, like um, the UK, at least in the context of the EU, um, to maximize the re reach and impact of the uh, trilateral uh, cooperation and to, to create, if you will, even a, a kind of a new centre of gravity in Europe that um, includes both the UK uh, and, and Ukraine and, and in this context, of course, Poland. And I think through these different mechanisms, we can uh, improve uh, cooperation between the two countries and others and, of course, contribute to uh, European security.
Thank you very much, James. And thank you so much once again to all our panelists for their um, presentations. And now we can move to our Q&A session. And we have a question from Chris McKeon, who is from the Press Association, and he's asking the following question. Mr. Chinogli said in his opening statement that the West could return Russia to the economic dark ages if it chose to do so. Is that what the Western allies should be doing, Mr. Chinogli? Well, it's, uh, it's interesting today, and in the last hour, the Prime Minister has just announced immediate sanctions. Um, in the past, he would not he would have done that in, in a related issue. The British Prime has not done that. He would come to the dispatch box and said they were going to be working with the European countries to place sanctions. Now, clearly, um, if going to go to very significant sanctions and putting Russia into economic dark ages would be removing them from the Swiss system, for instance. You know, that cannot be unilaterally. That's got to be done through a coalition of, um, of, of the West. Um, and although uh, I believe that discussions have been going on about that, I don't think decisions have been made. So what was impressive today, that despite the, the ongoing discussions between leaders, the Prime Minister immediately came out with, I think it was four or five Russian banks and uh, three individuals um, to immediately set the them. Um, not he did delay, he said, you know, immediately going to sanction the and we're going to be talking about serious sanctions. But my, the thing that I get from discussing ministers is from a British point of view, um, they're going to take economic sanctions very seriously indeed. The question of course comes back to Dimitra's point is to what extent are our EU partners going to play ball with that? And I would say that there are indications over um, recent uh, weeks or days of um, the EU pulling together, in particular Germany saying that they're going to bring uh, Nord Stream 2 into political equation. So I'm hopeful. Thank you, Mr. Janogli. Mr. Nataluka, would you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much. I think that um, we are seeing positive si uh, signs from, from the EU indeed, uh, but uh, also some very troubling signs. Uh, for example, we have read today a statement uh, from the Serbian president, Vucic, who, who expressed um, uh, that he is, who, who expressed, you know, um, a very severe concern that he's experiencing incredible political tensions after uh, Putin um, recognized the territories. Uh, and we all know the relationships with uh, Russia and Serbia. And uh, uh, given, th given the fact that Serbia is not de facto a member state of the EU, it's still a candidate that has a plan to join in 2025, even though uh, in case of a recognition uh, of these territories by at least one European country, I would dare to say this will be the end of Europe as we know it, because it will lead to another um, potential point of, um, um, of pressure in the Balkans or somewhere else in Europe. So it's very important to keep the unity and uh, to, to react uh, unanimously. Um, and uh, I think this is, this is really what matters in terms of uh, speaking of Europe, uh, Europe as a whole. Um, as a whole, as a unity, as a whole, and uh, you know, as a, as as one single organism that shares these values and principles and uh, and the spirit. In terms of uh, the UK and uh, in terms of um, uh, the Ukraine, I think it's very fascinating to observe how we are going back uh, in a way to uh, 1904 and uh, Mr. Mackinder uh, giving birth to this idea of Heartland and uh, the importance of Eastern Europe in controlling it. Uh, and um, I think that uh, uh, in some way, um, this, this kind of potential ally alliance of, of, of uh, London, of Kiev and of Warsaw uh, reminisces back uh, a bit on, on, on this idea. Um, and uh, for me, uh, uh, it's very interesting to observe this. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Schellest. 
you know, with the sanctions, it's definitely very important to have uh, them both targeted and understandable, uh, because uh, sanctions uh, is not something that can have the immediate uh, uh, effect very often. That's why a lot of people thinking that uh, uh, sanctions may be not uh, effective. And here it is very important when we're introducing sanctions to understand that on the one hand, uh, they have very strong political effect just to demonstrate the unity, the unity of our partners who is joining them. It's not sometimes the economic value of them, but for the Russian Federation is uh, um, important to uh, uh, dissolute European Union, to dissolute the European unity in general without institutional organization uh, or, and of the partners of Ukraine. So as soon as we are receiving the single voice and uh, uh, similar sanctions uh, from Canada, US, all your UK, European Union, Japan, uh, uh, Balkan states, Turkey, that would be important because that is demonstrating the general unacceptance of the Russian actions. But at the same time, we know that the Russian Federation are um, uh, joking uh, very often from the European sanctions. Uh, that's why uh, currently we are already at the moment when the sanctions should be not only a political symbol, but also quite a serious. So others who are around Putin would think twice about uh, uh, their actions and their support of the president policy. And uh, here we understand that oligarchs, the Russian oligarchs, for quite a long time been uh, um, easy with Mr. Putin because they received the state contract, so they didn't care about the uh, uh, losses that they probably could have at other markets, their personal business being secured. Uh, so now it is really important to think about such uh, sanctions that would uh, uh, be very painful and uh, would make these people to think twice, should they support uh, with their political uh, uh, support, but also with their financing, the actions of the Russian president and the Kremlin. And uh, why I say that also with personal financing, even for the oligarchs, uh, not only state corporations, because when you look how these uh, uh, people are buying uh, Western think tanks or Western media, for example, that is coming from the certain money. Uh, and uh, for the last years, we became very well aware even of the private military companies. But uh, uh, don't forget that the same uh, uh, financial support is going for the religious organizations in many countries. That in this way, Russia opened all possible uh, um, uh, France uh, against not only Ukraine, but many European countries as well. So in this way, uh, um, less money is also important. Less opportunities is also important because uh, it should be clear understanding that it can't be uh, unpunished. That is not only by weapons the West can counter uh, the Russian actions. Thank you. And James, anything to add from your side? Uh, yeah, I, I would just like to reiterate that last point that uh, Hannah made, and that is that you know sanctions, although important, are not going to be a magic uh, bullet here reversing um, Mr. Putin and his kleptocracy in in the Kremlin. I mean, th this is just a, a, a part. It has to be a part of a broader package um, to deter and dissuade him from. Uh, embarking on the uh, you know the course of action that he has, um, uh, but at this moment I think it's really important that leaders such as the British Prime Minister, the U.S. President, the German Chancellor, and so forth, really um, issue a, a really strong statement to 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 declare just how far they're prepared to go in the event of, um, of further uh, aggression, let alone uh, open hostility against um, the Ukrainian capital. Uh, and in, in that context, um, I think it's really important that that statement or those statements are issued now within the next day um, so that, that that can be become very clear. And then the entire package of, of sanctions will then need to be prepared and, and rolled out very swiftly in the event of, of, of escalating uh, hostilities. But remember, they're only part of a, of a they can only be part of a broader package that require that will require direct military and other forms of financial support to Ukraine. Thank you, James. Um, the next question is from Lily Ong. Um, may I please also remind our attendees that um, we would ideally like also to see your role and affiliation. So she's asking the following question. Should NATO be expanding eastwards? Mr. Nataluka. Yeah, uh, so for me, the, the answer clearly and obviously is yes, of course, uh, but um, uh, let me talk about Ukraine. So uh, we have heard some speculations quite recently that Ukraine should stay neutral. Uh, 
Uh, and um, that is the trade-off that um, Putin would accept and would stop everything uh, if we would denounce our intention to join NATO. Um, let me remind you that uh, even given the fact that we have, uh, a, we have it in the Constitution, the, the declaration and the intention of our, of our government and our, uh, of our country to join NATO sometime, De facto, unless Kiev has a mutually binding uh, security obligations with another country, Ukraine is a neutral state. And look where this neutrality has, has, has taken us. I mean, we have been passively neutral, I think, until 2014. Since 2014 and until today, what you are witnessing today is our active neutrality. But it is still a neutrality, I must say, and I'm and I'm sorry to say this. So for us, NATO uh, is um, just a way of uh, of mere existence, you know, of survival. Uh, so uh, in in that terms, yes, definitely, uh, NATO should be expanding to the west. But uh, I think that the question itself might be put in a very um, in a very tricky way. Uh, it's, uh, I agree with the thesis that it's not about the NATO expansion. It's about free countries uh, willing to, um, gain, to, to, uh, to, uh, to get the membership in NATO uh, by their own will. It's not that somebody comes to you and forces you to enter. It's about countries who are willing to enter there themselves. Thank you, Mr. Mataluka. James? Uh, yeah, I, I would concur entirely with those um, those remarks. Uh, I think it's really important to uh, point out that NATO is not even expanding. Um, you know, NATO is a defensive alliance. Uh, countries uh, seek membership of that alliance. Uh, that it itself isn't expanding. It's not an imperial power. Um, if anything, it's being drawn into parts of Eastern Europe by countries that feel uh, that their future is threatened by others. And in this context, of course, that, that those others are, are Russia. And I think it's all important because there, there's, there was a second part of that question, which um, was something along the lines of should Russia, a European country, be denied a role in, European in the European security architecture? Well, I'm afraid to say that Russia has not, or I'm actually pleased to say that Russia has not been um, denied a role in the European security architecture. In the 1990s, um, the, both NATO and the major Western powers tried to engage quite actively with Russia. Um, it seems that actually it was in the 2000s and the 2010s that Russia decided that it wanted to play a different role, um, and that is to say one of, of an aggressor. Um, and in that context, uh, Russia cannot have a role in the European security architecture because firstly, it is attacking and it has annexed the territory of another country. And then secondly, um, it is actually seeking to degrade the European security architecture that is, has been uh, established. And that's really a really important point to make. And I think it's one we must remember uh, going, going forward. Thank you, James. Mr. Ginogli. Yeah, I would like to see uh, Ukraine and indeed Georgia join uh, NATO. Of course, what we're seeing at the moment is something more fundamental, which is Russia denying the right of these countries to actually uh, to apply, um, which is basically a breach of their sovereign rights. Um, and actually, what we do see at the moment is not an expansion of NATO, but an expansion of, of Russia. Um, and uh, uh, Russia is constantly uh, playing the card of uh, NATO being an aggressive force uh, with the flimsiest uh, uh, evidence. Um, of course, the aggressors at the moment are Russia. Uh, I don't think, uh, despite Russian propaganda, uh, that anyone is being convinced by the, uh, by the Russian position. It's a very, it's a very weak one. Thank you, Mr. Ginogli. And Dr. Hannah Schellest? Uh, briefly, two points, because completely agree with what uh, um, colleagues been just uh, talking about. First, uh, um, that is, think about Ukrainian membership not only from the point of view of what uh, uh, NATO can give Ukraine, and Ukraine is seeking it because NATO is one of the biggest military alliances, but also what Ukraine can give to the European and transatlantic security. Um, we are not talking that Ukraine participated in all NATO missions abroad since 1994. 
we are not speaking that in terms of the practical experience of the uh, hybrid warfare, information warfare, cyber warfare, and the real warfare in the cities that experience Ukraine has and many of the European countries never experienced. And let's speak about the strategic airlifting, for example. There were so many news about Ukrainian big airplanes delivering uh, medical cargoes and military cargoes from Alaska to Afghanistan. That's uh, the capacities and capabilities that Ukraine can provide to NATO. So here it seems to me that it's definitely the time to speak not only about NATO as the security provider for Ukraine, but about that uh, real partnership that we have now and that partnership, uh, um, enhanced opportunity partnership that we have uh, since uh, um, 2020. That's definitely demonstrating the big opportunities that sometimes we are using, sometimes we are not experiencing in full. So here Ukraine can be the same contributor to the Black Sea security, to the European to the transatlantic security. But also in terms of uh, the Russian actions or uh, these actions, definitely you, uh, it's not only that, uh, or better say like this, NATO has never rejected the Russian role in the European and in global security. If you read the NATO strategic documents, uh, of 2010, for example, the strategic concept, Russia is named as partner, as a strategic partner. And you almost will not find a word about Ukraine or Georgia there. That's clearly demonstrated that by 2014, when uh, all this uh, started, um, nobody in the NATO countries has been uh, uh, rejecting Russia even more. They've been trying to involve Russia as much as possible to the uh, um, war against terrorism, uh, to, to many other uh, questions. But already at the same time, when you look to the practical cooperation, there were signals that Russia is rejecting this. For example, in the NATO Defense College in Rome in 2014, they didn't have any Russian officer for already two years, if I'm not mistaken. And it was said that we're inviting them, they are not coming. They are trying to cut relations between the Russian military and NATO military. So this preparation been happening, it been evolving. Unfortunately, we just lost the signals. We were not very attentive to them back in 2012, 13. Thank you, Dr. Schellest. Um, another question is from Patrick Trigloff-Tanin, who's a researcher at the Council. Um, could Putin now freeze the new status quo, like in Abkhazia, and end the drama? And I guess to elaborate a bit more on this question, what are the most likely scenarios um, uh, we can expect to see in the upcoming days and weeks, Mr. Natalukra? Yeah, uh, you had a very uh, one of my favorite series, actually TV series in uh, in the UK. It's it's called Yes Prime Minister, and uh, there is a very funny episode that doesn't look so much funny right now, um, which is called the Salami Tactics. Um, and uh, the idea is that uh, Russia goes slice by slice, and but it's never it it it, it does never stop. And uh, that is ex exactly what you can observe all over the world uh, since uh, since Transnistria started, I think, since Transnistria, then Abkhazia, then Ossetia, and uh, now you have uh, Ukraine. And um, I mean, uh, this is not a sporadic uh, um, kind of, you know, line of events. Uh, this is a, 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 an integral part of their foreign policy. Uh, this is how they create instability. Uh, this is how they influence the decisions and the foreign policy decisions uh, of other countries. So um, I don't think that um, ending the drama is the correct uh, wording uh, when you describe when you describe um, a potential frozen conflict in the east of Ukraine. Uh, what one should consider is that this will only give some time to Putin to regroup, to gather more forces to influence more countries and to launch another um, another uh, offensive. And uh, in the Munich Security Conference, uh, we have been absolutely serious, seriously talking about a land corridor from Belarus to Kaliningrad Oblast. And that is what potentially is coming next. So um, Putin is a product of unpunished evil. Uh, it is a product of silent consent. And the more uh, the West uh, gives him this uh, luxury of creating frozen conflicts and then uh, keeping them there, the more he feels, uh, you know, unpunished and he feels powerful to keep exploiting this foreign policy. So I think um, 
that is unfortunately what is going to happen in the east of Ukraine. I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but probably that is what is going to happen. But I, 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 I sincerely hope that is the last thing that is going to happen in such way. Thank you. Um, Dr. Shevest. You know, the frozen conflict, it's never a status quo because the frozen conflict is a very dangerous thing. And uh, back in 2014, they said that the frozen conflict would be the worst scenario for Ukraine. Uh, the problem is that when you look to the uh, other conflicts uh, uh, that we've been calling frozen, and usually this term I used only for the post-Soviet space, as soon as you freeze, uh, it's much more difficult to negotiate any type of the changes, any uh, uh, final resolution. A look to Transnistria, a look to Abkhazia and South Ossetia. The countries are discussing much more uh, talks about talks, where they see the next time, what will be the agenda, what would be happening, then discussing the substance, then trying to really resolve the issues where they are stuck with the questions like the car plates or, or something uh, small of this type and making all the small questions very um, uh, politicized. So that's why uh, the frozen conflict uh, is beneficial only for the aggressor because they don't need to spend the same efforts to secure this uh, territory. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, they will continue disturbance of the uh, um, of Ukraine in our case. So we saw it in other cases very much. The second reason is that if you compare with the, for example, Abkhazia, the situation being quite a different uh, in terms of, uh, first of all, for how long this territory is being first uh, without Russian recognition. And the second is that uh, uh, who've been in charge. There you had a lot of locals in charge. And uh, in uh, uh, uncontrolled Ukrainian territories, uh, most of the leadership, especially security leadership, it is the Russian citizens. So we, you have the outsiders who are telling how your territory should be uh, uh, ruled. And uh, insisting on elections or things like this, because when the conflict is frozen, that's easier to press international community for the political issues. So then you are asking, OK, you've frozen uh, the conflict or you recognize their independence. And then you have two million of the internally displaced people. How you give the rights for these people to decide by, uh, about their uh, future, about their land, about their access there. So it seems to me that the, um, we don't have something as a status quo yet, because the situation has been changing uh, a lot during these eight years uh, at the uh, separate regions of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. But at the same time, the frozen situation uh, uh, will just uh, play in Russian hands. Thank you. Mr. Janogli. Yeah, I think you need to split the uh, Russian uh, narrative propaganda uh, from the reality of the situation. Uh, if you ask uh, Russians to talk about with Ukraine, they talk about uh, being a common language, a common ethnicity, a long-term future uh, in terms of a murder, However, when you talk about Tata, that they will talk about uh, Russia going in to save Muslims from villages, and uh, they actually want to be out as soon as there's a settlement. That's the narrative, which is different. In practice, I agree that, uh, that they are very similar. The, uh, Russia is looking for frozen conflicts uh, with weak, corrupt buffer areas that they can dominate in both cases, and that suits them in certain medium term. Thank you very much, Mr. Janogli. And James? I don't have much to add in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, frozen conflicts. I, I don't think they're particularly frozen. Um, I agree with the previous participants. What I will do is just um, in the last couple of moments, I'll say a bit about how will, how should the UK respond to it in the eventuality that, 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 that Putin um, ends his um, latest round of uh, this kind of offensive on Ukraine um, with this recognition. Um, I think, of course, the UK would take a slightly different, is going to take a slightly different um, stance uh, if, if that is where it ends than if it escalates further still. Um, but I think it nonetheless gives more um, ammunition to those countries like the UK and some others that have um, argued that the West or the democratic world more generally needs to take a much more 
robust stance towards um, the kleptocracy in the Kremlin, um, and it will certainly empower uh, those those countries. And I think the UK does need to take an active role there in 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 securing that because we need to understand ultimately that this isn't a this isn't just strategic competition. This is actually something becoming more and more akin to a, a cold war, small c, small w. That's to say a a, a form of competition was. Um, uh, with um, an antagonist uh, that 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 really is going to lead to the the, the prevailing of one over the other, and uh, I think we need to be very very clear that we don't want Russia um, under the current leadership to prevail because if if it does prevail through the salami tactics, then eventually um, everything that we've built to achieve or worked to achieve, sorry, over the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War and, and even during it will will come to nothing and we'll see gradually uh, insecurity reign supreme across whole tracts of Eastern Europe. And that will inevitably, as we've seen in the past, um, come to directly affect the UK. And therefore, we have a vested interest in ensuring that the Atlantic uh, security system that we've constructed over the last, um, well, since the end of the Second World War, in some respects, um, prevails. And Russia's vision of uh, security, which is through dominance, Russian dominance, does not. Thank you very much, James. It is unfortunately already 2 p.m. and we have to end our discussion, but I would like to sincerely thank our panelists and also the audience for joining us today. And I hope that you enjoyed the event, especially keeping in mind how timely this topic currently is. We have now kickstarted our events program and we will be bringing many more interesting discussions on geopolitical security matters and environmental security challenges in the upcoming weeks and months. You can find further information about our events on our website, www.geostrategy.org.uk slash events. And you can subscribe to our events on our website, www.geostrategy.org.uk. .uk slash subscribe. Thank you so much once again and see you next time.